Good morning. Welcome to the Ventura Vineyards Online Services for Sunday, September 27th, 2020. My name is Brian. I'm your service host. I'm glad you found us and that you're here with us today. Uh, right out the gate, I want to tell you that it's the end of the month. For some of you, you don't even know what month it is, but I said it at the beginning. It's September. And being that it's September the 27th today, this is the day we as a community celebrate uh, the greatest of Christian ceremonies, and that is communion. Uh, our teaching team member will lead us in that after they're done with their teaching today. And so if, if you haven't prepared, if you weren't aware, you are now. So you got a couple choices. You can put this on hold, you know, push your pause button on your Roku or your television or whatever you use to stream this, or uh, turn up the volume so you can continue to listen, but go get yourself some bread or a bread-like substance or some wine and some wine or a wine-like substance, uh, grape juice, what have you, uh, to participate in communion. Uh, so my duties as the service host. Um, they're pretty clear. They're codified. They're part of what we do every Sunday. But for those of you that are new to us, uh, I'm going to let you know what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start off with some worship. After worship, uh, I'm going to come back, uh, tell you about a special announcement. Um, I'm going to take an offering. Uh, we're going to pray for the offering. And then I'm going to introduce uh, our teaching team member who will bring today's message. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the two men that will be leading us in worship this morning. That's Jared Bangs and Jim Wilmoth. They'll be sharing their gifts, their talents, and leading us in worship. Please join us. Yes. 
Spirit, come and fill this place. Let your glory now invade. Spirit, come. on me come wake me from my sleep blow through the caverns of my soul pouring me to overflow spirit of the living God come fall afresh on me Come wake me from my sleep Blow through the caverns of my soul Pouring me to overflow To overflow Welcome back. Well, since you found us here on YouTube, uh, you know about us. And uh, if you're new to us, I'd like to let you know of how you can continue this uh, conversation. Uh, the Ventura Vineyard has set up several different avenues in which uh, you can communicate with the church. It's a little more difficult during these times, but uh, it's pretty simple. Um, if you don't have our app, that's probably the best place to start. Go to your app store, type in Ventura Vineyard Christian Church. It will magically appear uh, on your smartphone or your desktop, laptop, computer, uh, as it's magically appearing here over the faces of my family. Uh, in that app, you'll see a lot of things, uh, a plethora of items that you can access, you know, what's going on in the church, just all kinds of scads, we'll call it information. But the two things I'd like you to uh, focus in on, and that's our connect button and our prayer and care button. The, the connect button is simply that, a, a means of communicating with us. Pretty much any question will be answered, uh, pretty much. Uh, ask away or let us know what's going on. Uh, we also have a uh, prayer and care button. Uh, those are more specific. If you have need of prayer for yourself or for anyone, we have a prayer team. They'd love to know about that. For anything whatsoever, please let us know. And the care button is simply that. It covers all aspects of uh, need. If you're struggling uh, with anything, please let us know. And if it's something that we can help with, we'd love to do so. Uh, other avenue of communication is our website, venturavineyard.org. Set up like a website, has all the same information as the app. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook for ongoing uh, communication, back and forth, postings, pictures, all that kind of thing. Uh, type in Ventura Vineyard and you'll find us. And of course, right here on this YouTube channel. Uh, 
One other button I'd like to draw your attention to is the Give button. Uh, we as a church, like most churches, we exist uh, by the giving of those that participate in and call this place home. And so if you're one of those people, we encourage you to give. And uh, today on Sunday, even though with an electronic giving, you know, people give throughout the week, today's the day that we acknowledge those gifts. And with that, we'd like to pray for the uh, offerings of the people. So if you just take a moment, bow your head and pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to gather together uh, in this electronic sense, uh, Lord, and in the real sense that we are all participating simultaneously as, as a, a fellowship, as a group. And Lord, we ask your blessing on these tithes and offerings that come uh, to continue to support the work of the Ventura Vineyard in our community and places beyond. Uh, please bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I have a, an announcement uh, to share with you. Um, we lost a member of our community recently. Um, Mr. Bruce Jackson uh, passed away. Um, Bruce has been a longtime member of the Ventura Vineyard. Uh, he served faithfully on our prayer team. Um, he will be truly missed. Um, one of our elders uh, and a teaching team member, um, Richard Sockle, will be facilitating a virtual memorial for Bruce. Uh, this memorial will be held on October 3rd at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, we're asking that you please let us know if you'll be attending. Uh, the, the way we're asking you to do this is to go to venturavineyard.org, our website, and then just simply put a slash Bruce Memorial, Bruce dash Memorial, and that'll take you to a registration page. Uh, click on the registration button and put in your information saying that you'll be attending the memorial on October 3rd at 2 p.m. And what this does is it populates a, a list that we can send out the invitation uh, for the Zoom call for the virtual memorial. So please, RSVP, if you have any questions, uh, it should appear below me as a link uh, here on the YouTube page. And if it doesn't for some reason, if there's some sort of difficulty with that, then I direct you back to the connect button and we'll send that link out to you. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce an esteemed member of our teaching team and her message this morning, The Way of Jesus. This is Katherine Anderson. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone. I can't believe it's already fall and it's already the end of September. Oh, wait, before I forget, there are notes in the app, sermon notes, and uh, you don't need them. Uh, there's no uh, write-in lines or anything. There's some questions that might be interesting at the end, and it's also just sort of a collection of um, random thoughts of things I thought I might put in the message, but it would have been too long, but I still think they might be interesting. Anyway, if you want to download the um, sermon notes from the app. Today is the last Sunday of our Third Way series. And for me, this has been a very instructive and a very hopeful series. By hopeful, I mean that we've learned that there are ways that we can act and behave and respond in this world that uh, do bring wholeness, that redeem, and that heal, and also help to transform both us and the world. But it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. And today I'm going to talk about what for me is the most difficult and frankly insidious and subtle obstacle to overcome in order to live 
in this world in a way that does allow for wholeness, for shalom for all. Living the way of Jesus is difficult. And I'll get to that subtle, uh, subtle obstacle in a bit. But first, our lectionary reading for today is one of my most favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This passage poetically and lyrically retells the story of Jesus. It's a compact version of the gospel. It reads like poetry or a song. Many people believe that verses 5 through 11 of the passage were an early Christian creed or statement of belief. Others think it's a worship song known to early Christians, and some think it is a poem, maybe even written by Paul for this church. The words in this passage or poem are meant to remind us of two Old Testament passages. The first in Genesis, where we learn that Adam and Eve were not content with what God had given them and they reached for the apple, in essence, claiming for themselves, grasping for the power to be more like God. The second passage we are meant to recall is the idea of the suffering servant in Isaiah, as well as another passage in Isaiah, where all nations uh, come and bow before the one true God. Well, let me talk a little bit about this letter of Philippians in which we find this passage. And to do so, I must give you a little history, which, as many of you know, is one of my favorite subjects. But I have heard from some of you that it is not your favorite subject, so I will keep it brief. On the map that you see, uh, you can see that Philippi is located uh, in modern-day Greece, in the northeastern area that the Bible calls Macedonia. It was originally a Greek city, named after Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. When the letter to the uh, Philippians was written by Paul to the Christians in the city, Philippi was no longer a Greek city, it was a Roman city. And the citizens of Philippi were extremely loyal and devoted to Rome, very patriotic, and for good reason. The city was full of veteran soldiers from the Roman army, their families, and their descendants. And here's how it came to be that way. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, a civil war started. Octavian and Mark Antony waged war against the assassins, which included Brutus, and the assassin armies. Octavian and Mark Antony won, and they chose to share power at the Caesar level. How do you think that worked out? Yep, another civil war broke out this time between Octavian and Mark Antony. Octavian won, Mark Antony died. Octavian became Augustus, the same Augustus who was Caesar at Jesus' birth. Augustus was pretty smart. Civil wars leave lots of hard feelings. The soldiers who fought for Mark Antony were punished by having to forfeit all their land, their property, and their possessions. 
and they could no longer live in the Roman cities in the area we think of as Italy. But Augustus did not want them disgruntled. He did not have to worry about their loyalties. He wanted to make them loyal to him. So he gave all of these soldiers who had fought against him tracts of land in Philippi in order to recolonize a formerly Greek city into a Roman city. Augustus funded and supported a citywide rebuilding project so that ultimately Philippi looked like a miniature Rome, complete with a forum and temples dedicated to the newly minted god, Augustus. There were also gold mines in Philippi, so there were lots of ways for these veterans to become wealthy. It was a very loyal and patriotic city because the inhabitants recognized that they owed their very lives and their livelihoods to the generosity of Augustus. In the book of Acts, we learn how the church in Philippi started. Paul and Silas arrived in Philippi during one of Paul's missionary journeys. On a Sabbath, they walked to a place on the riverbank known as a place of prayer, a place where Jews could gather and worship apart from the temples dedicated to Augustus and the many gods of the Roman religion, apart from their neighbors who would question their loyalty because they did not participate in the civic Roman religion. The gathering appears to have been small, mostly made up of women. And after Paul and Silas taught, one of the women, Lydia, asked to be baptized. And this was the beginning of the church in Philippi. We also learn from Acts that Paul and Silas walked off into the riverbank. And for several days during their walks, they were followed by a fortune teller, a young slaved woman who earned her owners a great deal of money. This young woman was shouting at Paul and Silas and about Paul and Silas, perhaps to attract attention to her fortune-telling skills. And this went on for several days, and finally Paul had enough. He commanded that the spirit that possessed her get out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. And it was gone, just like that, along with her psychic ability. Her owners were furious. They were suddenly out of business. They went after Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace and accused them of disturbing the peace, of being dangerous agitators who were against Roman law and Roman customs. So the judges had Paul and Silas beaten publicly and then thrown in jail. And the judges told the jailkeeper that Paul and Silas must be kept under heavy guard with leg irons on so there was absolutely no way they could escape. But that night, while Paul and Silas were singing worship songs in the jail, there was an earthquake. The jail fell apart, the doors fell off, and the prisoners began escaping. The jailer came running in. He assumed that Paul and Silas had escaped, and he pulled out his sword to kill himself. But Paul and Silas shouted, wait, 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 we're still here. Impressed and shocked, the jailer came over. What must I do to be saved, he asked. Paul and Silas sat in that falling down, wide open jail and told him the story of Jesus. I think that's such a beautiful metaphor right there. The walls came down, the bars were off, and he got to hear the message of Jesus. And that very night, the jailer and his entire family were baptized. Right away, the church in Philippi is growing. The next day, the judges told Paul and Silas, Oh, you've served your sentence. You're free to go. And Paul said, mm -mm -mm. Wait a minute. You have broken Roman law. I am a Roman citizen, and you broke Roman law by having me beaten. Ooh, this was bad. Philippi prided itself on its adherence to all things Roman. So the judges in the courts of Philippi ended up apologizing publicly to Paul and Silas. And after saying goodbye to the fledgling church of Philippi, Paul and Silas left. But we know that Paul returned at least one more time to Philippi, and there are indications that he could have returned several times. This letter that he wrote to Philippians that contains those wonderful verses I read earlier is very different from all of his other letters in the New Testament. First of all, he wrote this letter while in prison. Not in prison in Philippi, but possibly Rome, maybe another prison. 
Second, it's clear that this is a letter between friends. There is a lot of good history here between them. And thirdly, it's a thank you note prompted by the fact that the Philippians have sent a member of their church to the prison where Paul is. Epaphroditus is his name, and he brought a financial gift to Paul from the Philippians. In a Roman jail, you had to purchase everything you needed, or you had to have someone on the outside who could bring you food, blanket, warm cloak, writing and reading supplies. Epaphroditus has brought the means for Paul to survive his imprisonment. Unfortunately, in doing so, Epaphroditus became extremely ill and he nearly died. Finally, in this letter, unlike other letters, Paul isn't responding to a doctrinal question or a church discipline issue. But Paul does want to encourage the Philippians. He knows the tension they live with. He knows that their neighbors disapprove of them because their religion does not conform to Roman religion and Roman patriotism. According to the author David A. De Silva, the believer's commitment to one another and to Jesus as Lord and Savior makes it seem that they are opposed to the common good and unity of the city. Paul is encouraging his friends in Philippi to match the external society's hostility with internal uh, unity, support, encouragement, and aid. I've gotten in the habit of checking out the Bible Project videos before writing my Sunday morning messages, and they do have a great one on Philippians, and I've already used some of the content. According to Tim Mackey, who writes the Bible Project content, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays that all revolve around the center of gravity of the letter, the center of gravity being that amazing poem that is our lectionary reading. I want to read verses 5 through 11 one more time. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Dr. Mackey went on to say in, his, uh, in the uh, Bible Project video, the essays or vignettes that make up the book of Philippians take up key words or ideas from the poem that show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. Living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. The examples that Paul gives in the letter to the Philippians are himself, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. They have all suffered on behalf of others. They are examples of people living out the Jesus story. They didn't look to their own interests. They looked to the interests of others. He wants to encourage the Philippians by reminding them that suffering for being associated with Jesus is a way of living out the story. I said earlier that I would talk about what, for me, is the biggest obstacle to living out the Jesus story. It's me. It turns out I have a lot to learn about myself, a lot of unexplored territory that trips me up. So this morning I hope to contribute to what Ginny was talking about last week on the false self by using myself as an example. About 10 years ago, I began to be attracted or drawn to the contemplative tradition. I am, after all, an introvert and contemplative, contemplative practices are very appealing to me. I'm also a head knowledge kind of girl. My default mode of acquire, acquiring a new skill is to learn as much as I can. And some of the things I was learning in the con contemplative tradition and some of the practices seemed like a really good fit for me. I enjoyed letting go of the way I had been praying, and I enjoyed the freedom to pray in new ways. 
I enjoy just sitting with God and allowing myself to experience His love. But I wanted to go deeper and learn more, so I started reading Thomas Merton. He was way over my head, especially when he talked about the true self and the false self. Frankly, what he said made no sense to me at all. I have a Merton quote. All sin starts from the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my own egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life to which everything else in the universe is ordered. Thus, I use up my life in the desires for pleasures and the thirst for experience, for power, honor, knowledge, and love, to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real. And I wind experiences around myself and cover myself with pleasures and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible to myself and to the world, as if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covered its surface. I had no idea what he was talking about. And then about five years ago, I started reading books by Richard Rohr. I know that many in this church are very familiar with Richard Rohr. In his work, I kept running into talk about the true self and the false self. And drip by drip and drop by drop, some of it began to make sense to me. Let me uh, give you just a brief summary of what I think is meant by the terms true self and false self. The false self is the identity we show to the world. The labels we use to describe ourselves are helpful starting place. Labels might start with our appearance, our jobs, our education, our economic status, our abilities. The false self also includes how we define ourselves in terms of relationships. For example, children, in order to please their parents and make them happy, will act in ways that are encouraged by their parents. And as children, we begin to internalize the messages we receive from our parents. You are the good child. You are the smart one. And if we haven't been successful in keeping our parents happy, we internalize other messages. You are a troublemaker. You never learn. And this happens throughout a lifetime of relationships with friends, spouses, employers, children, parents, and even church members. The false self is who we think we are. It's how we differentiate ourselves from other people. I am this and I am that. I am not this and I am not that. Rohr says that the false self is the container we move through life in and we inevitably, inevitably believe it is who we really are. Turns out we get very attached to our false self. We don't know any other self. And consequently, we spend a good deal of our energy in protecting it and promoting it. Richard Rohr calls the false self an ego-based operating system. Let, you, let me give you an example. I have always been, or no, it has always been very, very important that people see me as competent in whatever I'm undertaking. And most of the time that serves me very well. It means I show up uh, prepared, I don't waste your time, and I get the job done right. But if for some reason you don't think I did a great job, I get very defensive. And I will prove to you that my work is excellent. And if for some reason my work is not excellent, I will prove to you that it is not my fault. Learning about the false self, false self has been very helpful to me. It has helped me understand why I respond or react the way I do in certain situations. It has occasionally helped me pause and actually check my reaction and my response. And it has caused me to spend more time with God to process questions like, what the heck is going on inside of me and why is this so hard to get a handle on? The true self is much more difficult for me to understand. And so I'm going to use Richard Rohr's own words. The true self is who we are and have and always have been in God. And at its core, it is love itself. Love is both who we are and who we are becoming. It is our participation in the life of God. The true self is where union with God is possible. 
when we are in touch with our true self, we no longer need to protect and promote the false self. When we are in touch with our true self, we no longer need to protect and promote the false self. Why am I talking about this? What does this have to do with those wonderful verses from Philippians? Because there are so many things that get in the way of us being able to incarnate those verses, of us living the way of Jesus. And they are things within us, which is why there are so many verses in the Bible that are about dying to self. Luke 9, 20, uh, 9 verse 23 says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And Mark 8, verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And there are many, many more verses like that. It turns out that dying to self is not a one and done kind of thing. It's an ongoing, everyday kind of thing that we need to do over and over and over again. The language of true self and false self resonates with me, but maybe not for you. Perhaps for you, learning your Enneagram type will help you see patterns or filters in your life that are uh, unhelpful in learning to live like Jesus. Perhaps it's the language of Strength Finders or Myers-Briggs, where we learn that our Unique gifts and traits sometimes make it difficult to understand each other, or we learn that uh, our gifts uh, may, or strengths may have a dark side. Or maybe it's the language of order and disorder and reorder that makes sense to you. I said at the beginning that there is a subtle and an insidious obstacle to living the way of Jesus, because there are things within us that have to die, things that we are unaware of. So. Here's what happened to me. I have been a Christian for literally decades. I've been an elder in two churches. I'm on the teaching team. And most recently, I've listened to two months worth of third way sermons, some of them more than once. And yet, just a few weeks ago, this happened. Tom and I were having a socially distanced backyard dinner with longtime friends. It's another couple. We've been friends for more than 30 years, closer to 40 years. We look at life the same way, we have the same values, we vote the same way, our kids are friends, we vacation together, and we share the same faith. And during a wide-ranging conversation after dinner, we began to talk a bit about local and state politics. My friend had actually worked for uh, Ventura County for several years. And my friends made an observation about something and someone in government a totally innocuous observation. But for some reason, I decided to take the contrary view, and I went on for some time. My conscience actually tried to tell me to stop talking, but I didn't, because I was making some exceptionally good points, and I felt like I was taking the high road, the more magnanimous point of view and definitely one that all brainy, sensible people would agree with. Finally, their body language let me know I had gone too far. I stopped and I apologized. It seemed that there were no hard feelings on their side. But over the next two days, I was in turmoil. I could not figure out why I felt the need to be that person who went on and on when I was making those points. Something they said caused my false self to react. I still don't know why, and I don't know what it was. But at that moment, it was important to me that people see me as open-minded, competent, able to impart wisdom. I made the conversation into something that would make me be seen the way I want to be seen. Why do I feel this need? Why do I still feel this need? I visited my friends a few days later to apologize and acknowledge what I had done and to listen to what they needed me to hear. And in doing so, I learned that I had both offended and hurt them very much. 
And this is why I still say the obstacles to living out the words of the poem are so insidious. Because in the few weeks since then, the few days since this happened, I've caught myself doing it a few more times. I am apparently very attached to this version of myself. I am clinging to it. And I'm quite sure this is not the only thing that I'm clinging to. Letting go of the false self can be very challenging and very painful and just plain confusing. I am, however, starting to learn that when I am differentiating, comparing, contrasting myself to others, I'm doing so out of my false self my ego-based operating system. When I am labeling others or mentally relegating them to some status, I'm doing so out of my false self. It might be helpful to think of the false self as the movement away from others and consequently away from God. On the other hand, the way of Jesus is when we move toward others, when we really identify with them, And we're able to say in some mysterious way, I am this other person. The true self comes from God. When we operate out of our true self, then there is connection to others, compassion, empathy, and grace. Living the way of Jesus will definitely involve some painful moments of letting go. But we are not alone on this journey. We are together with the Spirit. Today is communion. I hope you had time to gather the elements and have them near you. During this sacrament, we move toward God and others. We do this together. Communion reminds us of what Jesus has done on our behalf and strengthens us so that we can embody him in this world. Communion is a multi-sensory representation of those verses from Philippians. We are meant to lay down what we cling to in this world that creates barriers to God and each other. We are meant to identify with Christ, and we do it through these elements of bread and juice. And when we identify with Christ, we will see our own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. We are invited here because we are loved by God. We are here knowing that we didn't earn the invitation, but because we need mercy and grace. We are here because Jesus first loved us and gave himself for us. On the night he was handed over, Jesus had a meal with friends. He took a loaf of bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. Giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink it, remember me. I hope that we all together will learn how to live out this Jesus story. Amen? And now we get to worship with Jared and Rachel and Jim. Thank you so much.
there My faith was torn to shreds My heart out of balance You were there Still, how? 
like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory
Well, that does it for this Sunday's service. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, if you need to get a hold of us here at the Vineyard, uh, go to the app, go to that connect button or the prayer and care button. Let us know what's going on, please. Also, if you'd like to send us an email, uh, it's our email address is simple. It's contact at venturavineyard.org. Uh, for several weeks now, we've been hosting uh, a little gathering on Zoom uh, after the services. Uh, above and beyond all that gets discussed there, the number one function is really a chance to see each other in real time. And so if you would like to participate in that, we highly encourage it. Uh, the Zoom link should be below me here in the YouTube uh, description. If for some reason it didn't show up, just go to VenturaVineyard.org, our website, uh, slash Zoom, and you should find the link there. So that does it for me. Uh, have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you here back next Sunday. God bless you. Stay safe.